the infrastructure, getting new supplies to market faster. my hands to uh, We have a distinguished panel today. Your full, the full bios of the panelists are in your program, but I will introduce all four of them briefly and then we'll, we'll go right into our discussion. We will have time and we're looking forward to taking your questions about 35 to 40 minutes into the session. We'll have handheld mics for that. So um, starting off with Mark Florian, he's the Managing Director and Head of Infrastructure Funds at First Reserve. Rick Grafton from Calgary. He is the uh, CEO and Chief Investment Officer of Grafton Asset Management. Charlotte Phillips, the Managing Director of Xenon Capital Partners based in London with a certain amount of time spent in... Based in Moscow. I'm sorry, in Moscow. With a certain amount of time spent in a lot of interesting places. And Gerd van der Voe from Royal Dutch Shell. He's the Managing Director of Shell Technology Ventures. Um, so, panelists, I'm going to start off by asking a kind of a quick lightning round question. And Mark, we'll start with you since you're at the end. Okay. Um, okay. Just to get the discussion going, this panel is composed of a group of truly global thinkers and doers on the energy field. So, and we're asking, you know, when you're talking energy, you have to take long-term perspective. So, I'd like each of the panelists to just throw out what they think of as the kind of most promising or threatening, your choice, uh, development that you see happening in the energy infrastructure field in the next, let's say, 20 to 30 years. Thanks so much and good afternoon everybody. Um, I think there's three things that are going on right now that are driving change and so I'll talk about them very briefly. First of all is growth worldwide and the, the need for energy, particularly in non-OECD countries. We see that obviously the growth in Asia and in emerging markets. Second, the avail availability of new resources, whether they be unconventional resources, oil and gas as we see in the shale plays in the United States and starting to in other parts of the world, or uh, the growth in renewables as, as, as an alternative. And then finally, coming from that, just a massive in infrastructure need in terms of power that's needed, in terms of transportation of oil and gas to markets. Those things are all driving the markets. Now, what does that mean? There's about an estimated by the OECD, $37 trillion of new investment that's needed through 2035 in energy infrastructure. Um, we need to transport oil and gas to market, so there's a lot of midstream infrastructure. Renewables is estimated to be about 60% of the new power generation globally, so a lot of construction in the whole renewable space. We see that as a trend that's it's happening now. It's been happening the last few years and it's going to continue. The second trend, big trend that we see is as the cost curve for renewables comes down, uh, there's the potential for parity. Uh, where that's not going to happen today, it is in some parts of the world, but over time it will happen more and more in various parts of the world where having distributed energy such as solar panels on your roof will be competitive to buying off the grid. That's going to be a huge transformation as you can imagine if you're a utility that's got a lot of capital investment and now all of your customers are producing their own electricity. And then the final thing I'll mention is um, storage. As we all know, it's hard to store energy. Usually we produce it and we use it, or it goes away. And uh, I think a longer term trend is eventually we will get cheaper and better uses of storage technology, and that's gonna be uh, an incredible moment uh, for all of our futures. I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Mark. <coughs> Rick. Uh, thanks. So I've been investing in um, energy for the last 30 years, and I come, out, I come from this from a Canadian perspective. And so Canada has 50% of the investable oil reserves in the world. We have the third largest oil reserves in the world. We are the third largest supplier of natural gas in the world, and we're the largest supplier of oil and gas to, to the United States. And all we care about is selling our oil and gas at the burner tip at the highest possible price. And currently, uh, in the last decade, there's been a big quantum shift where we used to have strong demand in America, North America, and we didn't have supply. And currently the supply has ramped up and the infrastructure has not caught up with that. So we're going to talk a little bit about what's happening there. Um, I'm not going to focus on the next uh, 20 years, I'm going to focus on the next 5 or 10 because okay. I haven't met any CEOs to look out 20 or 30 years. So I. I as an investor, I'll just stick to the next five or 10. So we have um, a massive 
regional infrastructure pro a problem that has caused differentials to widen all over and it's caused the Canadian energy um, industry to rethink how we're providing America with uh, oil and gas and we're now in the early stages of going how can we get our oil and gas to the global markets where they can receive the highest possible price on the world market both on the gas side and the oil side. So we can talk about a couple items today, uh, the Keystone pipeline, okay. other pipelines that are being built, what is the best way to transport transport these uh, hydrocarbons and then we can talk a little bit about from the environmental side and uh, CO2 emissions and um, what's going on in, in that side. So that's basically and at the end of this we'll just talk about what I think is probably the best investment opportunity I've seen in 30 years because of that. Well and that's a good point Rick. One thing that people at this panel will probably be, the people in the room will probably want to know is that we will get into the financing and investment potential part. That's a key part of uh, the opportunity here and the discussion will take place. Charlotte, what do you want to lead us off with? Um, well I'm based in Russia and therefore um, renewable energies and um, energy efficiency is not yet on the um, agenda that high. It's still very basic large gas producer, um, large oil producer, but what I find still quite extraordinary is that we've moved now from oil and gas and coal to solar energy, wind energy, hydro energy, but we're actually transporting energy still. Like in the last century, it still goes, the Romans used pipelines. Um, we've been using wires for electricity forever, and I'm sort of waiting for the moment where we can actually find solutions to transport energy more efficiently, more quickly, or store it more efficiently and more quickly because for a country like Russia, which is the largest country in the world, with huge climate challenges and with at the moment an infrastructure which is purely dedicated to Europe, if you look at the pipeline maps you can see that everything goes to the West, um, building infrastructure projects is a, is a great, great challenge and um, will remain so for a long time. Thank you. Gerd? Um, well, for my side, uh, um, there's three challenges really. One is growth, the other one is technology, and the other one is climate. And I invite Rick to come and work for Shell for a little bit because our CEO thinks 20 years ahead, not because he likes to, but because he has to. <laughs> uh, so we do tend to think ahead uh, quite, a, quite a bit at Shell through the scenarios work that we, uh, we uh, support. But if you look at the world, you know, 2050, uh, it's going to be 9 billion people. Uh, we're going to have growth uh, in terms of energy demand of two-thirds mm -hmm. to 100%. Um, most of those people, 75% of those people, will live in big cities. Yeah? And so uh, there's going to be more than two billion cars on the road. So that's the, the, the challenge we have in terms of growth. Um, and, and that means that we need to put our hand on any molecule of energy we can get. You know? So we believe that the hydrocarbon world doesn't compete necessarily with say the more renewable sources of energy uh, we need both yeah that's that's my first uh, thesis okay uh, secondly on technology what we see in technology and energy is that uh, these technologies are being deployed way too slowly it takes too long time to bring the technologies to market uh, innovating through the supply chain like we have been doing in the past relying on our suppliers to bring new technology and innovation to the market is not good enough anymore. So we need to reach out directly to the innovators in this world to find the technologies that can actually feed that demand. And um, so, uh, and the last thing is climate, but probably very important. It's CO2 and methane, greenhouse gases. Um, you know, without a, a, a credible uh, price for CO2, uh, there's not going to be enough pressure on the markets to come up with innovative solutions to deal with greenhouse gases. So. Again, on the regulatory side, things need to happen there. And on the other side, uh, in terms of carbon capture and sequestration, things also need to be speeding up. Thank you. Uh, you know, one thing I think it would be great to segue to would be the whole pipeline question. Because that's when we're talking about in energy infrastructure, we're going to get into transmission as well. But pipelines are the way that mainly, but we'll talk about the other forms also, uh, oil and gas, natural gas, are transported. Now, of course, in North America, we have discussions, debates, political opposition, 
in Eurasia, there are some things that Charlotte, you've been involved with. But why did the panel take a shot at what are some of the things that are going to happen in the pipeline uh, world, both in this continent and also in the Eurasian continent? And are there, you know, the bottlenecks to the build out of that infrastructure? Are they financial? Or are they political? What are the things that we have to look out for? Charlotte, you want to? Um, yeah, I think it's quite clear the bottlenecks for pipelines, especially in Eurasia or in the Caucasus or Russia, are political. Because what one has to remember is that the oil and the gas needs to be transported across countries to get to market. So the country which sits in the middle and has only the position as a transit country has enormous bargaining power, as one can see, for example, with Ukraine, whenever it goes, um, the question is gas supplies to Europe. Ukraine sits there and can switch off or switch on the pipeline depending on how their own battles go with Russia. Um, I was involved in the financing of the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline, which goes, brings oil from Azerbaijan, from offshore fields in the Caspian to the Mediterranean by avoiding the Bosporus. Initially, it used to go via the Black Sea and then via the Bosporus, via Istanbul to the, to the Mediterranean. And the interesting, so the problems was not only to get Azerbaijan, Georgia in the middle, a country which has no natural resources mm -hmm. and 150 kilometers of pipeline, which it was bargaining with incredibly strongly to agree onto intergovernmental agreements. But then all of a sudden the Russians piped up and said like, well, we don't really like that because all the Caspian oil always goes through our territory. And we do not want to have small satellite countries such as Azerbaijan have the oil exported, and it's a billion, uh, million barrels a day, so it's a big pipeline. By now, I think it's even 1.5 million, um, without us having some political influence. And if you look at the east part of Russia, mm. same thing. At the moment, there is one pipeline which goes to the Pacific coast. One single um, pipeline. One single. No gas, only oil at the moment, the ESPO pipeline. And that was already a major drama because the Russians kept on having a um, suspicion about whether they wanted to really start exporting energy to China. So the Chinese, it was, the, the Russians still view the Chinese, I think, traditionally as slightly um, complicated um, partners for energy exports. So um, Very diplomatic. Yeah, well. <laughs> Do you see that, though, Charlotte, is inevitable at some point, the build out of pipeline capacity between Russia and, and I do think, um, I think for gas it will be inevitable because there are gas fields in the Siberian East which have their names printed on for China. It makes no sense to divert that gas to bring it all the way mm -hmm. um, to Europe. And I do think that Europe, having become stronger, a stronger bargaining partner with Russia because of the anticipation that there will be an enormous shale gas boom from America bringing energy to um, Europe, um, has alienated Russia to a certain extent. And so what will happen at some point is that the Russians will agree on a gas price for with China. And then, but whether it's five or 20 years, I don't know. OK. Um, well, I might as well talk about Keystone right away. And, and <laughs> get another room. What yeah. I want you to think about is Fire away. not about what happens if Keystone happens, but what happens if it doesn't happen. And so Keystone's a pipeline that will carry 800,000 uh, barrels a day of crude, some American crude, some Canadian crude. And if that doesn't happen, um, what they're already working on is we need 15 rail cars, with, uh, 15 trains with 100 rail cars each, and that wow. will ship wow. the 800,000 wow. uh, barrels a day. So the rail transportation will be one of them. I ask myself this Rail question. from Canada to the U.S. or? Rail from all, because it's not all coming from Canada, right. the crude. Rail from the, the North Dakota Bakken, rail from Canada there. So that, that's one thing that's going to happen. But I, I look at this as quite a ridiculous debate because the trains uh, have more CO2 emissions, they, uh, dangers of leaking, uh, dangers of uh, an accident are far outweigh the risks of what a pipeline would be. So I'm, we look at this currently since the Keystone tried to approve, <coughs> there's been uh, 15 pipelines approved, and they will produce 4.4 million barrels of crude. So Keystone just happens to be a political debate, and um, we, we'll see where that goes. But the bottom line is we will get our crude to the burner tip. We'll get it to the east coast, 
we'll get it to the West Coast, or we'll ship it by rail. So that's that's what's okay. uh, in, in front of us on that side. Okay. And Mark? Conrad, maybe I'll comment a little closer to the wellhead, which is, which is a whole other di different dynamic than these geopolitical uh, issues going, crossing uh, country lines. We, uh, uh, one of the areas that we're invested in is in the Bakken Shale in North Dakota. And it's a fascinating place to go if, if you ever have a chance. All you see is wheat fields, prairie, and oil wells. And um, uh, what, what's happening up there right now is everything's moved by truck. Uh, and you bring water into the wellhead, you bring water out of the wellhead, and oil out of the wellhead, and then you, most of the wells up there actually just flare the gas, and just burn it uh, right at, on site. So uh, one of the things that we've been working on is putting pipeline systems there, and there is, there is no infrastructure. Uh, that, that move all the water, move the oil, and actually move the gas as well, which is a great solution. It's about five or six dollars per barrel of oil cheaper. Um, it is environmentally a lot better because you're moving the natural gas rather than just flaring it, and you're avoiding a lot of, of diesel trucks. Um, and then ultimately, it's much more reliable because you don't have to worry about trucks sliding off the road when there's three feet of snow on the ground. Uh, the challenge in that is that requires a whole bunch of money, a whole bunch of focus. And it will take years to build it out. But nonetheless, uh, it's, pipelines can be a solution, not just for the movement of these goods, but also much more environmentally uh, feasible, as well as um, just much more efficient in many, many ways. So you need to think about these international pipelines that are moving crude cross-country, inter-country, inter inter but also just even being closer to the wellhead. There's a lot of infrastructure that's needed there as well. Do you want to? Yeah, what, what I think people often underestimate is, is more about, you know, introducing new energy systems into the consumption of energy is that it simply takes time for any energy system to get to market. Whether it's PV or it's nuclear or oil and gas or, or wind, if you look at the introduction speed of all these energy systems, it's remarkably similar. It takes a lot of time because of a couple of inherent rules uh, that we have in the energy industry. Number one, it's very capex intensive, you need a lot of money, right. going back to your point. Number two, it's learning by doing, so you first have to build a, a pilot plant and then you have to get the teething problems out before you can build a first commercial scale plant and, and, and so on and so forth. And a good example would be uh, the gas to liquids technology we developed in Shell. I mean, we started research in 72, we started up our first commercial plant last year not just because it takes time to develop technology, also because the oil gas seems to fluctuate between $9 a barrel and $143 a barrel. That has quite some influence on it as well. But it, it, that simply takes time. And then you have things like you're trying to replace existing energy systems that are fundamentally written off. Yeah. So you're competing with CAPEX and OPEX against only co OPEX. So that's kind of hard to, to, beat, uh, to, to, to beat that. So, so these are all reasons why it takes so much time to introduce new technologies and make it substantial enough to, to create a splash, yeah, to, to reach materiality. What I'm hearing is that there are a lot of bottlenecks and challenges, but I'm not hearing that the financing part of it is, I mean, CapEx is a huge issue, of course, or a huge need, but it sounds like the, the money is there. Yeah. Mark, are you, I, any, money's I there. The money is the money's there. there, I think it's, a lot of uh, what it comes down to is risk allocation and who's willing to take the risk. Um, so uh, when we, uh, there's, for pipeline systems, there's many, many different ways in which these pipelines get built and in, in are supported by revenues. Sometimes you take the commodity price risk, as you were saying, which can create a lot of volatility. Sometimes you take drilling activity risk uh, in, in a region when you're putting a pipe in that region. You're making, you're creating a stake in that region and how much activity there's going to be. Or sometimes the producers are willing to take those risks and are willing to provide what are called take or pay contracts and say, look, I'm just going to rent space in the pipe no matter what volumes pass through it. And so I think that mm. sometimes is, is the issue is who's willing to take the risks of the development of the activity in that region and how do you allocate those risks. Those are the kinds of conversations we get in with a lot of the producers and, and uh, joint venture partners that we have. Okay. So, Conrad, I think you have to look. The money's there if oil's $100. Because at $100 a barrel, the IRRs on a lot of right. these light oil projects are... They work. They work. At sub-80, uh, then the economics are dramatically different. And we've definitely seen this on natural gas prices when 
gas was five or six dollars an MCF. There was twelve, thirteen hundred rig count. Right. Today there's three hundred and sixty six rigs drilling for for dry natural gas. So it, it's an economic issue. Energy companies are driven by economics. That's what will will drive the go ahead. So well. Rick, are we or anyone are we in a little bit of a false uh, nirvana in terms of low natural gas prices, making people think, oh, it's going to continue, you know, for for years and years and years. We've found a a new bliss point. Well, in the natural gas, because it's a complex situation. The liquid rich natural gas plays work. There's an IRR on them okay. and, and, and money is being spent on that. Okay. The light oil projects work because we're in a good commodity price there. But it what appears to me from the media, people talk about America's self-sufficiency. And currently uh, the US produces six and a half million barrels a day and they use 15 million. So okay. that's eight and a half million barrels. And they're talking about getting self-sufficient and with that concept, it seems that they're thinking, well, oil prices are gonna go down. Well, they won't get self-sufficient, which I, I don't believe they can because these are unconventional reservoirs that come on very quickly and then decline by between, and I'm being kind, 60 to 80% in the first year. So not only, really? yes, so the, 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 this is the horizontal multi-stage wow. fracked wells. They come on, um, so America has to find another eight and a half million barrels a day to get to self-sufficiency, but then they have to maintain it, and that will be the trickier the part. Challenge. Which is why I'm always suggesting a more North American solution um, is, a, is a better way to go. Include Canada in the discussions, include Canada in right. the infrastructure. But none of these projects work at sub-$80 oil. Okay. Well, one thing, you know, when we're talking about pipelines, we think about the big land masses, but let's also talk about transport of na liquefied natural gas. Shell's been a leader in that, I know, for decades. Is that going to be a, a big component, does the panel think, in terms of the, a real big part of the energy, you know, uh, uh, the percentage of uh, global energy supply and demand in the next 20 years? Well, you're asking the world leader in energy, in yeah. LNG, to yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's a <laughs> to confirm whether he believes in LNG. Yeah, you know. <laughs> They're hoping uh, so. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know, with the with the increase of unconventional gas and, and 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 shale oil in the U.S., obviously, it's not just LNG or gas liquid technology that will thrive uh, and and create potential export opportunities, but also the chemical industry. You know, you got you know plenty of relatively cheap feedstock, and already you see, you know. Um, uh, chemical companies, w when they have to decide between putting the next plant out in Europe or in, or in the U.S., mm -hmm. you know, clearly moving towards the U.S. So that's more of a risk to Europe than it is yeah. to the U.S. But w we as a company are very interested in any technology that can basically create cheap gas into more valuable products. So whether it's LNG or GTL or gas to chemicals or, you know, anything. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, and I don't know whether low gas prices are here to stay. Uh, I only know that they happen to go up and down, and uh, I don't know which sequence. At Shell, when you model it, do you take a whole range of what? Yeah, we look at three yeah. different scenarios, you know. Uh, yeah. Low, medium, high, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, then the bankers do very sophisticated about it, so. <laughs> so when we talk about pipelines or moving energy, it's not just pipelines, it's also energy, uh, electricity infrastructure. And John Wellinghoff, the commissioner of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, was not able to join us today. He would have, of course, spoken to that, but let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, there have been calls in this country for the construction of big super electric corridors. And uh, Mark, why don't you take that, because you're familiar with that world. But you made the point earlier about the growth of distributed and the potential for distributed generation. And I'm not sure, again, you know, most people really focus on the, the potential of that. Does talk a little, if you would, about distributed generation. Also, talk about does that mean that in fact some of these big uh, super highways of transmission that people have called for, including some large utilities, will not probably need to be built? Uh, boy, that, that we could talk about that for a couple of days. Okay. Um, I, I would say, in terms of uh, the, the grid, certainly in the United States, it's it's substandard, and and what has been happening is renewables has been growing. Um, you have difficulty of getting the electricity from where it's produced to where the load centers are, where we all are, to use that electricity. Um, and so if you look at a map of the U.S., and I think there's a couple of maps in the package, 
that show that there's a lot of wind in the, in the Great Plains and in, in the panhandle of Texas. Um, there's a lot of solar in the southwest. You can see it here along the coast in the center of the country. There's a lot of wind resource, but getting that to Chicago or to Atlanta or to New York City is, can be a real challenge. And so uh, we do have substandard uh, uh, long distance transmission. There is a very interesting set of projects going on in Texas right now. It's called CREZ, which is basically uh, some very large trunk lines moving electricity from the Texas Panhandle to Dallas and San Antonio and Austin and Houston ultimately. Uh, and that's been billions of capital investment. That will enable more renewable energy from the Panhandle to get to its markets in the end. We see a lot of problems with the power plants we have with um, there being too much electricity generated when the wind's blowing or the sun shines. As soon as you get a high concentration of renewables and the intermittency of those uh, uh, energy sources, when they kick on, it creates, it creates problems for the rest of the grid. So I generally think that we need to invest a lot more in uh, electric transmission. A lot of it's very old and doesn't have the capacity, capacities that we need currently. Um, I do think, though, further down the road, 10, 15, 20 years, the, di the distributed model, uh, particularly for areas like the Southwest, for Cal California, is going to be more and more the model. And it might actually make some of that uh, infrastructure I just talked about somewhat obsolete. Uh, so is the 15 to 20 year timeline on that based on the technology that's still yet to develop? It's not economic yet? What's, what's behind that? The uh, economics of solar renewables as a general matter are more expensive right. than conventional power. Uh, but we're seeing that change even. I can give you an example in a second. But um, the curve is changing. Uh, wind turbines are getting bigger and more efficient. So the price of solar has been coming down anywhere between 20 to 30 percent a year for the last several years in terms of solar photovoltaic, the panels. The panels. Um, and so you can see the argument uh, that in five to ten years, solar panels, if that cost curve keeps coming down, and you're also avoiding all the costs of the distribution system, um, about half my electricity bill is for the electricity and half for the distribution to get it to our house. If you can avoid both of those things, it, to break even to get solar on parity is actually not as far away as one might think. Mm -hmm. So when wow. we get there, it's going to be different in different regions, but depending on the amount of resource, uh, for example. Um, but when we get there, that could be a real game changer. It'd be tough to be a utility CEO when that starts to happen and your customers are generating their own electricity. <laughs> That's, it's totally outside my area of expertise, okay. but what I do know is with, like, with the abundance of natural gas and the abundance of liquid rich natural gas, we're a long way from, and, and energy companies are spending money on their top IRR projects, so I just, right. I, no, the, the, you're right, conventional power prices have been coming down too, right, because right. of natural gas, certainly in the United States, yeah. so those, those curves are constantly moving. But That's distributed right. energy can also be generated by gas or by flare gas, or it doesn't necessarily have to be renewable, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, um, right. solar. Yeah, we think of a guy with and a polar, uh, yeah, solar yeah, plant It doesn't have to roof. be the solar umbrella yeah. and then you make your own solar, your <laughs> bicycle. So it, it can be gas and, and it can be, and, and it's a big topic in Russia. The, the biggest problem, which I don't know how that is in America or in the United States, is the question that the grid operator and the transmission companies are actually quite opposed to um, distributed generation projects because they right. see themselves ending up at some point where they will be always the supplier of last resort to the little Eskimo hut right. somewhere up the road to where there is sadly no um, solar power and no other power, uh, power available, but they are entitled to receive their power. And they, so the grids will be ending up with the unprofitable, unpopular segments of the industry. And the Russians have developed quite a cute way of dealing with that. If you want to take off your company or your enterprise and introduce distributed power for yourself, which works very well if you have some associated energy, either cook oven gas so or on. flare gas, etc., then the local grid company assesses how much investment it needs into its local grid to account for the big user coming off the grid. You have to pay it back. In a and then you have to pay that to the local grid, and that always ends up 
surprisingly, that it's actually more efficient to stay on the grid and continue to buy power where you pay 60% of your, of your energy price is transmission than actually cut yourself off and build your own distributed wow. power. So. Okay. Maybe one other thing in the mix uh, I'd like to throw in the mix is that the transportation industry in the U.S. is you know, still liquid fuel based. Uh, and, and, and so with the, the increase of, of gas becoming available in the market, you know, how do we uh, transition to gas consumption in transportation? I see a gentleman from Toyota Motor Cars uh, in front of me here. So, you know, how, do, how, how, how does that uh, economy uh, of many millions of cars switched from, from gasoline and diesel to, to gas? Is, is, is LNG or uh, uh, natural gas, uh, can, can it make this switch? Yeah, is one of the things. So it's starting to happen, and uh, as you saw, there was a recent announcement, some of the railroads are looking at using right. yeah. uh, gas for uh, locomotives as well. It makes a lot of sense if you have a centralized system with fleets. So for bus fleets or for truck right. fleets in, in a regional area, to the extent you don't have to recreate the infrastructure of refueling stations uh, far and wide, it, that, I think that's the first place it's going to happen. Yeah. Okay. And in Europe, you have a very wide network of, of gas pipelines. You know, uh, most homes in Germany and Holland, you know, you use gas to cook your food on and gas to, to heat the home. You don't have that so widely spread in the U.S. Right. So again, you know, it's, it's the whole infrastructure that needs to be uh, transformed, which will take time. Again, since we don't have a regulator with us on the panel today, we, but we do want to talk about the regulatory system, I just want to ask the panel, is the regulatory system in, whether it's North America, whether it's Europe, is it a help or a hindrance? The, the political systems that we have to basically, and we're talking pipelines. Mark, you're, you're smiling, so I'm sure there's something <laughs> behind that. I'm, a, I'm a, uh, the suspect. No, I, I think it, uh, uh, the regulatory system and the stability of the regulatory system is absolutely critical. And, and when, when we look at risk, uh, we try to analyze, is the regulator going to be stable and consistent over a long period of time? And that's a really hard thing to, to measure. So uh, one example that's one that many have focused on is, is Spain uh, for, for the subsidy of renewables. There was a very simple and straightforward and frankly a, a good uh, system of tariffs, feed-in tariffs, that were utilized to subsidize both uh, uh, wind as well as solar. And that's, the government's been clawing that back slowly mm. and surely and, and changing that regulatory <laughs> overlay, uh, which is there, are, there will be bankruptcies of some of the, the folks that actually built a lot of this type of equipment, these power plants in that country. Um, even in the U.S., it's a patchwork. Uh, each state has its own right. system, has its own way of approaching it, uh, and how you get reimbursed is, is quite variable. So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky, tricky environment uh, in which to invest. Well, I have a little side. I have a, a good friend that's worked at TransCanada and his only job has been to focus on getting the Northern Gateway there. Right. And he's been there for 30 years, and he's retiring next year, and I don't think he's going to quite get it on yet. <laughs> so I would say... We're not going to talk would about say, that at his retirement party. I would party. say it's quite a slow process, right. and, and it used to just be the regulatory groups, but now it's also um, First Nations, it's environmentally right. groups. Uh, the federal government and our provincial uh, government in Alberta, they lose... $25 billion a year in potential tax revenue because of how long it takes to get these hooked up. So for the first time, I'm hoping there's some political will and pressure to get this there, but it is a very slow and long process. You're talking about political pressure and will within the United States. Within not so Canada much to get the export pipelines, okay. but um, I, I think it's for, that's a whole right. different game, so it's, totally. it's slow. Are you looking at me for regulator? <laughs> well, it's interesting to think about the experience. I mean, it's a very different um, world, the one you work yeah, in. Yeah, I think regulator doesn't really exist. I mean, um, there, oh, there exists one big regulator, yeah. put it this way, Mr. who regulates yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, but what is actually kind of interesting is that um, once the once the big regulator has decided <laughs> that a, a short pipe, big regulator, <laughs> <laughs> should we call him Batman? Yeah, yeah, because Batman. then everybody knows. Um, so once Batman has decided that a pipeline needs to be built and something needs to be done, then actually surprisingly, it goes quite fast. I remember that when we did Baku Tbilisi Jihan, it started in, two, in 1993, <laughs> and um, the pipeline was finished, or the inauguration was in 2005. Now, wow. if how many kilometers was that? Um, One thousand seven hundred. Wow. 
um, if the short, big um, Batman regulator would have done that, they would probably sort of have started to talk about it, but construction would have gone much faster because, of course, in the absence of a civil society, in right. the absence of um, environmentalists, once you decide to build, you build, and then it's done. Um, the sad aspect of this is that um, a lot of destruction happens along the way. Um, natural destruction. Natural destruction, yeah. For example, in Russia, big problem, forests. That the moment you build a pipeline to the forest, you and Russia has one of the world's largest yeah. um, forest trees, you build access roads to forests. And these forests are quite happy by themselves, right. not disturbed by anybody. Um, the moment the access road is there, illegal logging starts, poaching starts, and the access roads cannot be taken away. So um, that becomes then um, a bit of, of, of a problem. But um, having said that, apart from that, regulation or um, consultation processes with landowners, endangered species, or tribes, etc., doesn't really, sadly, mm -hmm. exist. But it goes quick. It goes quick. <laughs> we, we, we had uh, one uh, transmission project, which, which I smile about, because uh, the big issue was all the hang gliders in the region that wanted, would have been running into electric transmission lines uh, if, they, if it was built. And so the hang gliders were the lobby that stopped this project from happening. Full stop. Full they stop. It. It's, it's dead. Was this in California? Or? This happened to be in California. Gee, I wonder how that <laughs> happened. <laughs> well, speaking of California, what, yes, here. Well, I think also on the regulatory side, things haven't become easier to the regulators. Yeah, I right. mean, uh, the energy industry is like playing chess on, on seven different boards. You've got, you know, uh, local communities, First Nation communities. You've got uh, environmental interest groups, uh, lobbyists. You've got the oil industry. You've got e social economic uh, interests that you need to, to take care of. So it's, it's an increasingly complex problem that they've, they've been asked to solve. And now you've got you know the whole environmental pressure as well, um, so it's it's a tough uh, sometimes tough choices to be made in in an environment where the economy is not particularly thriving, so that right. makes it very very difficult. Very difficult. I think it's time to go to the audience for some questions. If people have things that they want to ask our panel about, we can take a few questions and come back. So well, there's a handheld mic in the back, and if you just uh, raise your hand, and how about this gentleman over over here? Oh, right here. Okay, fine. If you would just identify yourself and state your question. Uh, Jordan Cherry with Arlington Family Offices. Curious what the panel's thoughts are on coal. You really have a lot of infrastructure, especially in America, devoted to that, but yet it's uh, not very popular at this point, but yet when you look at the cost per kilowatt hour or kind of on an equivalency basis, it still seems to have a bright future, yet uh, is clouded in, right. in many ways. Okay, the question about coal. Who wants to start off? Um, in terms of coal in the U.S., I mean, I, I, about roughly 50 to 60 percent of our electricity is produced by coal. Um, and uh, it's, um, it continues to be further and further regulated. Uh, and as a part of that, um, it's going to be more and more expensive to produce new coal-fired power. So right now, it, it's, it is an efficient, um, from a cost perspective, uh, purely a cost perspective, not taking into carbon or the pricing of other things on top of it. <coughs> I think it's, uh, it, it is uh, a big part of our electricity generation right now, uh, but it's slowly going to decline if natural gas prices stay low and renewables grow. Uh, about 50 <coughs> to 60 gigawatts, which is, like, you, it's a whole lot of power uh, of coal, is actually going to be de decommissioned over the next three to five years. A lot of those are plants that have been around for 50 years, and, are, and it's very difficult to retrofit them economically given the environmental regulations we have now. So I, our view is slowly coal will decline as, as a, a power source, certainly in the United States. Are there any big coal plants being built by any large utilities at this point in the U.S.? The, there's one or two that are in the final stages, and after that there really is no so. new coal that will be built. It, uh, I'll tell you, give you one other interesting yeah. fact. Um, in Germany, as you know, there's a, a move afoot to close down all the nuclear, right. and uh, Merkel's solution to this is create lots of wind uh, power in the north, but the transmission to get that wind power to the load centers is, is lacking. Um, and so there's now more lignite being burned, which is uh, about the dirtiest form of coal right. uh, in Germany than ever as, as a replacement for other uh, needs. So 
you know, the U.S. is its own market. Each market, my only point is, each market has its own unique characteristics. Right. Rick, if you pull up slide 20, if we can get it up uh, on CO2 emissions and greenhouse gas. Um, so there, the big red, no, slide, yeah, the, right, the 20, slide 20, it was, it was up, yeah. If you look at the big red circles, that's coal <laughs> CO2 emissions. If you look at the little uh, blue circle up there, that's the oil sands. So just if you, if, if you take a look at that, and when you talk about the amount of retiring coal plants, basically that adds up to about 6.5 BCF a day of gas production that can be replaced there. Last year, gas prices were at record level lows at $1.90 in MCF, and there's a tremendous amount of gas switching for electricity, but when it bumps up to $3.37, which it has now, then you switch back to coal. So it's still right. going to be part of the package, but I don't see it, it growing in North America because of the big so the red circles. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we have up here. Um, the panel talk about oil and gas is a uh, one thing. In effect, is two different products for two different markets where gas today is mostly for the electric generation market and oil today goes to the liquid fuel markets for transportation. Uh, in particular, the new rich gas, uh, the liquid natural gas uh, products also go to pet petrochemical and does not go to transportation. Um, so I'm basically picking, picking up what Grit said. Um, that until we convert the transportation sector to work on uh, natural gas uh, as feedstock type, you know, to create fuels for natural gas, um, we are never going to be oil independent in the true sense because we are always price taker, not price maker. Right. Thank you. Question in. Who's got the mic? Right. How about? Oh, right there. Good. Uh, I was wondering if any of you had thoughts on the Monterey Shale here in California. There seems to be <laughs> quite a lot of disagreement on whether it's overhyped or really the next mother load for oil. So Will it ever be accessed, maybe also, yes. Right. So who has Monterey Shale? Um, I, I can comment on it. I mean, we, we, inside our firm, we do a lot in oil and gas uh, development. And, you know, it's early read, but it seems like there's a whole lot of resource there, if if California is willing to allow access to it, given the technology, the shale technology, it comes very quickly to the political question of whether California is willing to. That's exactly right. But at this point, do we have the technology? If we have the technology, feels. I mean, it's not my area of expertise, but certainly from what I see and hear, it feels like it is very accessible. Similar to the Bakken and some of the bigger ones. Yeah, a great example would be the Permian Basin, which is West Texas. Yeah. That's an area that's that's been uh, pr producing oil and gas for you know 60, 80, 90 years, and now people are going in and re-creating right. more resources off, out of an area everybody thought it was already used up. Uh, the Monterey is similar to that. So if you look at all of the different types of the Eagle Ferds is was much better, the Marcellus is much better. The Montney in Canada is much better. They haven't thrown the technology and the money behind California yet. So I, it, it doesn't. If it's going to work, you, you you'll find out about it very quickly. Like they just it'll just take a couple wells, and then all of a sudden the land the land grab will go. We have the mics in the back of the room, sir. Sure. Thank you. I'm Ambassador Kumson from Ambassador of Ghana to U.S. Uh, throughout the conference, uh, we've heard about the emerging markets and a bulk of the emerging markets are in Africa. A very large percentage of oil production is being discovered in various African countries, particularly along the west coast of Africa. My country included where we found the largest oil deposits, you know, five billion at one location uh, at the Jubilee Field. The challenge we face is energy, electricity. What, what recommendations and what programs as investors, as, uh, as energy experts, do you have to recommend, in addition to invest in providing electricity, where from South Africa to Egypt, from uh, Kenya to Senegal, electricity production is very spotty at best, with lots of brownouts and blackouts, and given the growth rate, 
Thank you. So, good question about what's the what's the future? Or how do you build up the uh, electrical infrastructure in Africa, electricity infrastructure in Africa, so that the region can grow, which is the theme of the conference, Charlotte? I know that that's not exactly your can, but you've worked in emerging markets, so maybe just any yeah. thoughts. Um, I tricky one because um, I I remember going to to the former Soviet Union in the early '90s, and it was a very similar situation where upgrading of power plants. Um, was so patchy and so badly done that um, even in winter at minus 25 or minus 30 degrees, one would sort of face brownouts and it would all of a sudden become um, either incredibly cold or incredibly dark or a combination thereof. Um, I do think that what one of the, of the key, and maybe that's a sort of tricky um, answer to give, is um, that with countries which have large um, ability to export carbon hydrates or to export oil, there should be revenue coming from that. And with that revenue, the government needs to be incredibly careful, um, diligent, transparent, and invest in the proper infrastructure, which is energy and um, electricity. And what I have seen, sadly, is that um, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, Russia is a great example um, where they have built the <coughs> most expensive Olympic, Winter Olympics in Sochi for 2014. And when somebody, or again, we're talking about the big regular, Mr. Putin opening a door, when, op when trying to go there, the door handle came out in his hand. And then finally, he got into the room, and the lights all came off. So basically, we're talking corruption. I mean, it, it, the, the big question is the investments need to be properly supervised and, and there needs to be a generation of um, politicians and civil society who is really, really concerned not about, to a certain extent I think it's unavoidable that they're concerned about their fast car and their nice apartment and whatever it is, but there needs to be a limit and there needs to be a generation which is concerned about the infrastructure development of the country which is an emerging market because otherwise all the riches of the oil are going to be wasted and it will just continue like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right here, sir. My question is to Rick Grafton. Um, in Canada, the Athabasca Sands, that is basically a pretty heavy crude mm -hmm. and will that be uh, detrimental now that the uh, North Dakota fields are developing a, a lighter crude? That's fine. Um, so we import, I think the number's 250,000 barrels a day of condensate, and that dilutes that, that crude. Uh, there's the refineries in um, the Gulf are use, use a heavier crude, uh, the Venezuela crude, the Mexico crude, and, and that crude. The Bakken is going to be just part of a North American energy solution. It, um, we are... Because of the Bakken and other light oil fields, we are looking for other markets for our for our crude, Asia, the East Coast. So I, I don't I just don't look at like like a big detriment, but we're we have bottlenecks that I talked about, and and it's a, an issue right now. But uh, the Athabasca oil sands is um, they use the condensate, they dilute it, it gets in the pipe and. Uh, so it's it's not as if that's going to stop us getting our oil sands to the burner tip. Okay. Over um, here, I think. Yeah, Mark Kahn from Omnivore Partners. Um, I'm a agribusiness executive. People have pretty much stopped talking about biofuels in the last few years. We still have sort of this renewable fuels mandate. We still have Brazil, but it doesn't seem to be a big part of the future agenda. Um, wanted to see your thoughts, you know, hear your thoughts, if this was going to come back, what directions it might take, and, you know, whether this story is basically, you know, just a farm state issue, uh, a, a dead political issue, or whether you think it still has some steam in it. So, Garrett, maybe you could take that because I know Shell Technology Ventures looks at... Yeah, we do. Um, yeah, in terms of technologies, we, we look at second generation biofuels, so biofuels from, from sources that don't compete with the, the food chain, because long term we believe that's where biofuels should, should be positioned. We have a large proprietary research uh, program inside Shell to 
develop those technologies and, and in the what end bring them to market. What is a biofuel which doesn't come from the food, the food chain? Uh, wood chips, for example, okay. uh, agricultural waste products, um, you know, uh, those kind of, uh, of sources. Uh, we invest a lot of money in, in the past in all kinds of biofuels technologies, including uh, uh, algae and, uh, and, and what have you. Um, Has anything come of those investments? I mean, well, yes, uh, in terms of we, we large investor in, in Brazil, where we have a, a JV Corin, uh, which is, you know, uh, biofuels from, uh, from, uh, from sugar cane. Um, but in the U.S., we, we, we believe uh, there is a future for biofuels, second generation, however. So beyond 20 years? Well, again, I mean, it goes back to my comment earlier. It, it is simply in the energy space. It takes time to, to, to develop those technologies and bring them to market. You, you got to build a pilot plan, the full-scale plan. Before you have materiality, you know, it takes, takes a long time and a lot of capital. But yeah. I think there's definitely a place for biofuels. But it's a bit, a bit, you know, horses for courses. There's going to be biofuels are going to be solution for certain regions and certain countries. And it's not for every country. It's like wind makes a lot of sense in Denmark, but solar doesn't make a lot of sense in Denmark, right? So um, I wish it did because it would be a sunnier place, Denmark. But <laughs> anyway, yeah. So it's you're going to have a mosaic of solutions, I think, and uh, and biofuels is going to be part of the solution in some parts in the world. We've got uh, 18 critical infrastructures. Uh, in the U.S., and the other 17 all depend on the electric grid. So when we have something like Sandy, uh, where the grid goes down in major swaths of area, like, say, the lower third of Manhattan, uh, generally everything else goes out, but occasionally not. For example, there were a number of buildings in lower Manhattan, including all of New York University, apparently, uh, that stayed up and continued to operate through Sandy, even though the grid was down possibly because of combined heat and power, possibly because they had solar cells and some expensive batteries in the basement that aren't cheap enough yet, or something. Has anyone you know done a study of that and seen if there were some of the things that were done to keep some of those buildings functioning uh, that would apply to other circumstances? Okay, good question. Um, Mark, why don't you? Um, the, the, uh, you're right, the university had its own uh, CHP plant. Um, so it was able to independently produce its own electricity and, and steam. Uh, so it wasn't part of the grid. Uh, a big part of what happened in the lower Manhattan was uh, there's, there's a uh, power plant uh, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard that was swamped. Uh, and um, it provides a huge piece of, of lower Manhattan's electricity as well as steam. So, uh, you know, having that infrastructure be better protected against uh, big uh, events like that uh, is, is critical. And, you know, frankly, I don't think anybody really ever anticipated that, that this power plant would be overwhelmed by water. So really need to think about those things. I, I live in Connecticut, and I was out without power for about 12 days. Um, and, uh, it, you know, we, all the electric transmission basically in Connecticut is above ground. doesn't make sense. It's more expensive to bury it, but isn't it pretty expensive to have to react to storm after storm after storm? So. Um, those are things that need long term. I think the regulator can really help in those cases by putting a 50-year plan to bury a lot of the critical lines or to, to protect against these big seasonal events that can happen for our power plants. Did you buy a generator after that? I, we do have our own there generator. You there you go, distributed <laughs> generation over here. Uh, this question's for Mark. Charlotte touched on a little bit about distributed generation. And I just wanted to know if you t uh, thought through the awkward relationship that occurs between the transmission line and distribution line owners and the uh, asset owners and, and who pays for the transmission and, and I, something that's to think through. I don't know if you guys it, have. It's a, it's a huge issue. You're exactly right. Um, what, what, what happens is that, uh, as, as, as she was saying, you have uh, the utility be the provider of the least attractive uh, energy to provide, which is the electricity that's needed when nothing else is working at, 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 at with your customers. Um, so there's a cost to that, and to having that reliability uh, uh, available and having still the distribution in place because you need it. Sometimes you're going to need it when the sun isn't shining. So um, it, it, it is going to be a real issue that regulators and utilities are going to have to grapple with. Don't know what the answer is yet. Okay. Uh, th this question is probably for all, all of you on the panel, but to turn north for a moment, 
and look north of the Arctic Circle? And what are the challenges and opportunities that you see on the polar cap? Polar cap. Okay. Anybody who wants to start off? Gareth or Charles? Or? Um, it's cold. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, uh, HSC uh, is even a bigger consideration there than it is uh, in other places because you've got such a uh, HSC sensitive. Means, uh, what does that mean? Health safety. Health, health safety, health safety environment. Safety. Thank you. So the environment is, is an even more uh, sensitive issue because you've got a very sensitive ecosystem. <clears throat> Yeah, so when it comes to, to drilling for oil and producing oil, um, those considerations weigh much heavier into all you do. And so there's therefore technology and, and, and being able to bring technologies to, uh, to the forefront that enable you to produce and explore uh, those reserves. Um, so again, it's going to take time before, um, uh, before, uh, before it will be uh, produced to its full potential. But uh, there it, be it certainly has a lot of potential. Is there going to be an energy race to the Arctic, from whether it's from Russia With or from Canada? I mean, how does that play out? They're having some debates, but I mean, <clears throat> Dome Petroleum was drilling in the Beaufort Sea back in the 80s. It was highly subsidized. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, the drilling season's very short. And currently with with this new horizontal drilling, multi-stage fracks, when you look around the world and you look in North America, huge untapped reserves that you need to get to that are economic at this price. So global, what price would it have to be for oil to be to actually economic. spend money up there to, to get it? And the season would is, is so short. Mm -hmm. I don't see that happening necessarily in my lifetime. Over here. Um, I'm wondering about that slide. Is that blue dot? Production or is that wells to wheels? Uh, well, that's emission from the oil sands. So from CO2. the production of of oil sands. Yes. So that's not really a uh, apples to apples comparison because the red dots are of burning the coal for electricity. Right. Do you have a question or you just want? Well, to I, I I just wanted to point that out that okay. I don't think that that's a that that's an accurate slide. Okay. But I wanted to ask Mr. Grafton, um, you said about rail as an alternative to Keystone. Yeah. Joe Oliver said the other day that he didn't think that that was going to work. Is you, do you know where his analysis differs from yours, or is he just being political because no. he wants the jobs? And who's uh, Joe Oliver? Before? Joe, he's the, he's the natural, resources natural resources minister for Canada. My point was that's how many uh, trains we need and how many cars we need to do 800,000 barrels. Um, right now, I think the number that we're uh, using on rails is about 300,000. I don't know whether we're going to get that far, but that's the number that we would need to get that far. And I do believe that Keystone will get approved, and it won't be necessary, but the method of transportation, a barrel of oil, rail is going to continue to escalate over the next three to five years. The difference with that's rail and or tankers is that you can take it wherever you want, right. uh, whereas a pipe goes from one place to another. Obviously, right. it's connected to other pipes, but sometimes that constrains the price you can get for your product, where rail has more flexibility. Right. And, you know, it's all about the net backs of what they're, what they're going to get for their, their barrel. And right now, um, when you can get around the differentials, you're better off shipping it by rail than you are by <clears throat> the pipelines right now. We have time for about two more questions. Quick ones. Uh, one in the back, and then we'll come up front. Uh, this is for both the technology innovation side and the project finance investors and going to DG and efficiency and so on. For battery projects, are there any particular battery technologies that you're excited about? And then in terms of a project financing model, ha have, have any of you guys worked on a project finance model that in incorporates storage, not necessarily as a component of generation, but exclusively a storage project? And have you worked on any? Good. Is there anything you're willing to divulge? Yeah, in that's terms interesting. Of models? The battery field is fascinating. Please go. So, so, you know, battery technology is very interesting. Um, we don't have the illusion that we can actually pick the winning battery technology. I've got battery technology entrepreneurs coming to my desk every week, right? And they all claim to have the best battery. So it's hard to pick the right one. Uh, but what we like to do is to to, and we are in the middle of of doing that, doing small test projects to find out you know, what's the, what's the business model around it? How can we make money 
with it, what's the customer value proposition we can build around it. And then over time, the market will prove which battery technology is, is the most optimal technology in the end of the day. Uh, but it's very hard today to pick the winning battery technology because there's so many choices available and we'd rather leave that to the market and to other players. The, and Mark? the most interesting uh, things in addition, I mean, you can store electricity or you can store energy. And some of the intriguing yeah. ideas that we see these days, um, not stuff that we would invest in at this stage, but is, is storing energy. What do I mean by that? Pumped hydro or compressed air storage or right. other types of ways to, you're not trying to store the electron, you're trying to store energy that you eventually release that creates the electrons. So that's a, another alternative. Is that there. happening or is exactly. that on the drawing board? There's definitely people pursuing projects, but they all need, subs it's expensive. Yeah. So yeah. they need some, some somebody to subsidize. Yeah. No, definitely, it's a, you're absolutely right. It's not just electrons that you can store and use as a storage medium. It's hydrogen and other molecules, quite frankly, that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, uh, that can also uh, fit the bill. Okay, thank you. One more. No Sorry. one's invested in a project is the question. Has anyone invested in an actual battery project? No. No. no, no, no. Come back next year. <laughs> I want to ask about um, America's uh, energy uh, export infrastructure, specifically LNG and the ability to take uh, Powder River Basin coal, which is much cleaner, and put it in places like Japan and China. It seems like there's two political roadblocks. One says we don't want to uh, export America's cost uh, or uh, uh, energy advantage, but uh, above and beyond that, there's just so many, uh, there's been, uh, this is such a revolution and a change in the last 10 years with American energy that there's just really no port or uh, and, and not as lot of rail infrastructure for either coal or natural gas. And how, how does this play out? Is this, is this uh, going to be kept in-house or, or do we really look at exports? Who wants to take it? Well, I think it's both, but you go yep. first. <laughs> okay. uh, you, uh, in terms of coal, uh, Powder River Basin coal is already being exported to Europe in particular and certain other parts of the world. So it's happening because the local market has declined. You were talking a little bit about that, Rick, earlier with the gas to coal switching. And so that coal needs to find a market. Some of it's being exported. In terms of natural gas, there's really just one big export terminal, Chenier's terminal that's being pursued right now. These projects are so expensive and they take so long to build. Um, you know, that will be a very uh, slow transitional change, as Hart was mentioning earlier. Uh, that, that's a you know, multi-billion dollar project that's at least a five, six year construction period to make it happen. Wow. So. Yeah. Yeah, and another trend that you see, there's a lot of talk and, and a lot of technology development around mini LNG, mini GTL where people are, are talking about building small-scale liquid natural gas or gas-to-liquid plants that, uh, that can actually you know, serve local customers or regional customers rather than having to build large pipeline systems. So I think there's a place for that as well. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you, panelists, for what I hope was a great discussion.